I am very pleased to welcome uh, Joyce Dalsheim from visiting from uh, uh, UNC Charlotte. Uh, we're doing research at the Iron Library connected to her current project that will also be uh, part of the presentation today. Uh, Joyce Dalsheim got her doctorate from the New School of Social Research and she has taught in Israel and in the United States. She is at uh, UNC Charlotte, as I just said. She's the author of two books. Uh, the first one is called Unsettling Gaza, Secular Liberalism, Radical Religion, and the Israeli Settlement Project, um, a book that is dealing uh, with, uh, that is putting right-wing settlers and left-wing uh, activists in the same, or secular activists in, in the same framework of analysis. They're all settlers. They're all settlers, okay. Just like we are. Just like we are, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the figure of the settler and the trope of the settler has been of great interest in, in the past decades of, uh, of research. Uh, but a very unusual uh, frame of analysis uh, which seems to be also true for um, for the second book produced, called Producing Spoilers, Peacemaking and Production of Enmity in a Secular Age, where, uh, as I take it, unintended uh, effects of peacemaking is uh, at the core it, it of It has to do research. with how peacemaking makes enemies. Right. And, and how all sorts of people are produced as spoilers of this sort of liberal peacemaking process. Yeah. So two books, one could say, maybe of very counterintuitive findings. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, in the spirit and, of Hannah Arendt. In the spirit of Hannah Arendt, and I was going to say maybe driven by, a, by an interest in the world where we can find something in the world that actually our theoretical frameworks or ideological frameworks miss to grasp. Yes. And uh, in that spirit, uh, I'm very pleased that you're here and thank you very much for uh, presenting and sharing your work here at the Arlen Center My today. pleasure. Thank you so much. And, and thank you everybody for, for coming today. Um, very nice of you to take time out of your busy lives. Um, I hope you enjoy this talk, um, and I hope we have plenty of time at the end for questions or comments or discussion, um, whatever. Um, so I will try to limit my talk to 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and I've done my best to make it a very user-friendly talk. So, um, so relax, enjoy yourselves. And, and pet the dog. <laughs> um, okay, so as Tomas said, this is uh, part of a larger project that I'm working on. Um, it'll, be, it'll be my third book. Um, and, and it has to do with the struggle to be Jewish in Israel. Um, so, in February 2014, the spiritual leader of a group of ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Beltzerebi, called on his followers to prepare to leave Israel and seek political asylum as refugees in the United States. The headline, in the Belton newspaper read initial preparation for mass immigration from Israel. It was reported at the time that American senators had already promised assistance in attaining refugee status for every Haredi family that wished to leave Israel. The Rebbe was worried. He was worried about the future for Jews in Israel. He was worried that life in Israel was becoming too dangerous but maybe not exactly in the ways you might think. He was not talking about problems of violence or the threat of war. <clears throat> he was worried about the possibility of living as Jews in the state of Israel and leading life according to the Torah. He was concerned that the conditions for living the Torah life were worsening in Israel and that such conditions might actually be better in New York. This might seem strange or even contradictory. How could Jews be worried about their freedom to be Jewish in the Jewish state? 
in this case, the Beltalebi was reacting to a proposed law that would make conscription in the Israeli armed forces mandatory for members of his community, which would interfere with their responsibility to study Torah. Studying the sacred texts is an integral part of being Jewish, a commandment, a requirement, a duty. If it is more than a way of life, but the means for protecting life itself, then clearly such study should take priority. And surely such study should be protected as a form of freedom of religion or freedom of conscience. Indeed, for many years, observant Jews who studied the Torah, the Shiva students, were exempt from compulsory military service in Israel. But that protection is beginning to erode. And members of the ultra-Orthodox community find themselves struggling against state policy in the Jewish state in order to protect their right to be Jewish. Some people might say this is an exceptional case. The ultra-Orthodox are a group that does not represent the majority of Israeli Jews. While that might be true, it is my contention that a broad range of Israelis, indeed most, if not all, Israeli Jews, share the challenge of being Jewish in the Jewish state. Israeli Jews struggle against state policy and with or against each other for control over what would count as Jewishness. Sometimes they also struggle to, for the freedom to not be Jewish. My interest here is in beginning to think about what this case can teach us about broader questions of human liberation, about human and civil rights, and more specifically about the problems of nationalism, assimilation, citizenship, and freedom of religion. I think these questions can be traced back to earlier iterations of the Jewish question in Europe. And here I would like to begin to consider how the Jewish question is transformed when Jews become sovereign citizens in their own state, and what this might mean for understanding ethno-nationalism more generally. These questions about liberation and human and civil rights were raised by Hannah Arendt, of course, in her critique of the rights of man, which rested on the problem of the abstract human being who was nowhere to be found. It has been suggested that Arendt's political analysis, in fact, all stemmed from her grappling with the Jewish question. And of course, many people have suggested that, that the Jews more generally are good to think for European nationalists and political philosophers because they obstinately demonstrate the problems of presuming universal concepts and the difficulty of universal liberation. The Jewish question, then, has been a catalyst for thinking about exclusion of minority and subaltern groups in modernity in general, including right now, in particular, the case of Muslims in Europe. Today, I want to take a slightly different turn. Continuing Aaron's analysis, I would like to follow the transformation of the Jewish question not to other minority groups, stateless people, or refugees, but rather to the outcomes for Jews themselves when they are no longer a minority, but sovereign citizens in an ethno-national state. Before I deal with these questions in any greater detail, allow me to tell you a story. In the summer of 2014, I spent some time at the home of an Israeli goat farmer. You are all wondering about the title of the talk. <laughs> Early one Saturday morning, as I drank my coffee and checked my email, I realized, to my surprise, that I was the only one awake in the household. Some time later, the farmer himself emerged in clean, fresh clothes. <clears throat> he didn't appear to be working. That was strange. The farmer was always up at the crack of dawn, and he always worked until sunset. So when I first saw him that morning, I began teasing him. What's this? Did I actually wake up before you today? Did you oversleep? Well, he said, since I can't milk the goats on Shabbat, I might as well get a little sleep. You can't milk the goats on the Sabbath? I wondered who would stop him. <laughs> Knowing that his wife was, <laughs> oh, they're so adorable. <laughs> 
Knowing that his wife was or has had been an observant Jew, and knowing that she lamented his habit of working endlessly, I thought maybe she had asked him to take this one day office each week. And so I asked the farmer why he couldn't milk the goats. If I did, he said, the milk would not be kosher. And of course, if it wasn't kosher, it would be very difficult to sell. But why wouldn't it be kosher? The farmer explained that according to the rabbinate, which controls certified foods as kosher in Israel, if a Jew milks his goats or cows on the Sabbath, that constitutes a violation, a desecration of the Sabbath, and the milk will not be kosher. Now this struck me as rather strange, since there are also rules about caring for animals, regardless of the Sabbath, and goats and cows must be milked every day unless they suffer in pain. And anyway, cards on the table, I used to work in a dairy farm in Israel myself. It was more than 20 years ago, but we always milked the cows on Saturday and the milk was definitely certified kosher. Mm -hmm. Apparently something had changed. What if a farm was too small to employ non-Jewish laborers to do this work? What did they do when there were no Palestinians or foreign workers available? What? Then the milk would not be kosher and thus not marketable? Don't ask me about halakha, the farmer said. Like many other Israelis, he seemed to think the rules were arbitrary and primarily aimed at creating jobs and generating money for the rabbinate. I spoke later to a kibbutz dairy farmer who said it was not true that a Jew could not milk the cows or goats on Shabbat. A Jew was simply prohibited from turning on electricity. Uh -huh. And so he said sarcastically, a Jew could be there and put the machine on the cow and then say, Ya Muhammad, come press the button. Halakha, loosely translated as Jewish law, can be variously interpreted, of course. But never mind about why Jews were prohibited from milking their herds on the Sabbath, and never mind what the particular source of this ruling might be, or whether there were rabbis who disagree, never mind if one could produce a commandment that might suggest precisely the opposite, that Jews must milk their goats or cows every day, including the Sabbath. Never mind all of that. My question was, how would the rabbinate possibly know? <coughs> Surely they could not send an inspector out on a Saturday to check, <laughs> right? They could not possibly allow a member of their staff, staff to travel or work on the Sabbath to determine whether or not a Jewish farmer was working on the Sabbath, because then they would be working. And well, you get the point. Aha! The farmer laughed. Now there are cameras. <laughs> yes, there is a video camera in the milking parlor. The farmer has a goat surveillance camera, and he showed me a website where I too could watch the Saturday milking. Again, I was baffled. Why did the farmer know the password for the camera that surveilled him? Well, as it turned out, he was the one who had to purchase it and install it. The farmer was required to provide the means for surveilling himself, or his goats, I suppose, to be more accurate. By now, I imagine you must all be wondering what this business about goats and cameras has to do with the broader issues that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, about how the Jewish question of Europe is transformed in modern Israel, or more fundamentally still, what we might be talking about when we talk about big questions like freedom, sovereignty, self-determination, or national liberation. <coughs> well, one of the questions I took to the field that summer had to do with the possibilities and limits of religious freedom for hegemonic groups, for people in power. When we think about citizens' rights, we're often worried about minorities and subaltern groups. Currently, concerns about freedom of religion are often focused on Muslims, especially in Western democratic states. But what happens when sovereign citizenship is achieved? Does such political liberation also extend religious freedoms to members of the majority or hegemonic group? Israel was established to ensure the survival of the Jewish people as Jews. 
as antidote to their precarious minority position in other places. But as Hannah Arendt taught us, Jewish emancipation in Europe was directed at abstract individuals who actually existed nowhere, while true emancipation would require the, exception, the acceptance of Jews as Jews. In the Israeli context, the question is whether or not Jews are free to be Jewish in the Jewish state and what exactly that freedom <coughs> might entail. The next question is which Jews are free to be Jewish and who has the power to decide. Here we might think of ethnic differences <coughs> and consider the question of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa, Mizrahim. And of course we can talk about any of these things later. I'm not going to go into details now about the structural racism at work in Israel. Um, or we might think of gendered inequality, where in fact women are asked to sit at the back of the bus or harassed for wanting to pray in particular ways in particular places. Some of you might know about the women of the wall. But another part of this question revolves around the criteria for determining one's Jewishness, which can be key to gaining citizenship in Israel. And again, we can think about comparing cases and issues of racism when we look at Ethiopian Jews and Russian immigrants who have come to Israel. But if the promise of universal rights is the premise of modern citizenship, as Etienne Balabar says, then what are we to make of the processes of cultural subjectification that citizenship entails? Certainly no one is outside of Foucauldian processes of self-making and being made through relations of power, or outside the intimate yeah, or outside the intimate processes of subjectification that occur through surveillance, discipline, control, and administration. But goat surveillance. Really? <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me get back to the story. As you've guessed, the goats are, in fact, milked on Saturdays. But on this farm, it is Palestinian laborers who, who do that work. On other farms, I've seen Eritrean refugees or other foreign laborers working on Saturdays. This way, the milk is kosher, and the farmer supposedly keeps the Sabbath day of rest. He doesn't, really. We might say he is kept Jewish. I spoke to another young man who had been working at a dairy farm, milking cows to save enough money to pay for college. And he was infuriated by this Sabbath rule. Working on Saturdays was worth extra pay. And he thought it was terribly unfair that just because someone decided he was a Jew, he would not be able to earn that overtime pay. So he told his employer, OK, so I'm not Jewish. And he proceeded to pronounce the words of Muslim witness. There is only one God, and he is Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, la ilaha illallah, but his employer just laughed. You don't get to decide. These issues are determined by the Ministry of the Interior, and you are a Jew, whether you like it or not. <laughs> the Ministry of the Interior makes its decisions based on orthodox rules of genealogy. And here we begin to see something of the ironies of the secular modern, in which religion is at once imagined as a particular kind of category or as a matter of choice, but at the same time can be made essentially inseparable from the person or collective regardless of one's practices. Jewishness became a nation that was imagined as not quite part of Europe, and that constituted a question or a problem. <laughs> this young man wants to employ the idea of Jewishness as a religion attributed to him. But now he is told that his Jewishness, not Judaism, is not a matter of choice. So the distinction between Jewishness and Judaism takes on added meaning and power. After all, no one was checking to see if this young man attended synagogue, if he kept kosher or covered his head. So what does this tell us about popular sovereignty and the possibility of being free to enact Judaism or to refuse Judaism about whether or not such liberty should be considered freedom of religion? While the halakhic determination of who is a Jew is primarily based on whether or not one's mother is a Jew, this process of determining Jewishness 
with or without Judaism, as a set of cultural practices, is one that in Europe was paradoxically thought to be a means of liberation. Everyone could be a citizen if one's communal heritage were ignored or treated as irrelevant, or if one's cultural practices could be altered and relegated to the private sphere. Of course, we now know that this process of secularization and assimilation did not liberate Jews. Instead, it led both to their near elimination and to their quest for self-determination, for sovereignty in their own state as a means of collective survival. Which brings us back to this young man, a Jew and a citizen of the Jewish state, who by reasons of birth cannot decide not to be Jewish. You are a Jew if you are born of a Jewish mother. Well, mostly. It turns out that some people who can clearly demonstrate their Jewish ancestry can also be denied Israeli citizenship. Indeed, such ancestry could pr prove an obstacle to citizenship. How could it be that in the Jewish state, one's Jewish genealogy might hinder one's ability to earn a living because you are Jewish whether you want to be or not, and at the same time, this genealogy might prevent you from being granted citizenship. During that summer, when I stayed with the goat farmer, I met a couple who, upon retirement, had moved from the United States to Israel. They purchased a home and settled in. Jason and Judy presumed their Jewish genealogy would allow them to make Aliyah, be granted citizenship under the right of return. This is the Israeli law that promises citizenship to Jews anywhere in the world who seek it. The Jewish state was established to provide a safe haven for all Jews. The right of return is a foundational law aimed at fulfilling the promise of safety in one's own homeland. And of course, by definition, the Jewish state requires Jewish citizens. But in some cases, genealogy might not be enough or maybe too much. This couple explained that being in Israel made them feel they were finally home. And yet they seemed to be Jewish in a way that was unacceptable, even threatening, perhaps more threatening than not being Jewish at all. Jews have freedom of religion everywhere but in Israel, Judy said. Her husband and members of their community celebrate, she and her husband, and all the members of their community celebrate all the Jewish holidays. They study the Torah, they pray on Saturdays, they have a glass case in their house that prominently displays their menorah, Shabbat candlesticks, and even a shofar, a ram's horn to sound for the high holidays. Judy and Jason have a ketubah, a Jewish marriage contract, as did their parents and grandparents. Jewish genealogy is the grounds on which Jewishness is determined by the state-sponsored Orthodox rabbinate, which sets the standards for making such determinations about citizenships in Israel. Judy and her husband's genealogy were not in question. Other issues that might interfere with gaining citizenship in Israel did not hold true in this case. They were fine upstanding citizens, they didn't have a criminal record, they weren't trying to take advantage of the state, they weren't pretending to, to be Jewish, <coughs> they weren't criminals hiding from prosecution. They came to live in Israel with generous retirement benefits from jobs in the United States, and yet there seemed to be some problem. When they brought their documents to the Ministry of the Interior to apply for citizenship, the clerk looked over everything and welcomed them to the country. It seemed clear that their family history proved their eligibility to, to apply for citizenship under the law of return. But several weeks later, they received a letter explaining they had been denied citizenship. Soon, they found themselves traveling back and forth across the border between Israel and Egypt or Jordan just to renew their visas. As time passed, it became clear that if they left the country, they might be denied re-entry. So when I met them, they were living in Israel, but they were not quite legal residents. Yes, retired outlaws. <laughs> what made these two middle-class retirees so problematic? How could they be Jewish but denied citizenship? You've guessed. I'm supposing that by that you've guessed. 
they told me that they believe that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. <laughs> they belong to a group known as Jews for Jesus, or Messianic Jews. When I visited their home, Judy spent more than an hour explaining to me how biblical texts prove that Jesus was in fact the Jewish Messiah. Expressing her frustration with their struggle for citizenship, she said it seemed ridiculous that someone who was completely secular, an atheist, or even a Jew who believed in Buddhism, could gain citizenship more easily than she. And then, with a certain outrage, she spoke about the Lubavitcher Hasids. You know the Lubavitchers? Mm -hmm. They had no trouble at all becoming Israeli citizens. But some Lubavitchers believed that their Rebbe, Menachem Schmidt Schneerson, was himself the Messiah. Nowhere is it written that the Messiah will come from Brooklyn, she said. <laughs> and like you, I nearly laughed out loud, but she was not amused or joking. She was quite angry about this injustice. There he is. Why should they be permitted citizenship under the law of return and she and her husband denied, when obviously Lubavitch's belief was completely unsubstantiated and hers was clearly the true Judaism. This, I thought, was a remarkable contrapuntal moment. In the current context, it's really quite impossible to imagine that ultra-Orthodox observant Jews are not Jewish or that those who accept Jesus as the Messiah are more Jewish than the ultra-Orthodox. While it is clear that many non-Orthodox or non-observant Israeli Jews find themselves socially and politically opposed to the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox, I know of no proclamations in the public sphere that members of these communities are not really Jews. Like the issue of how inspectors of how inspectors could know whether or not a Jew was working on the Sabbath, the question of how anyone would know about their beliefs arose in our conversation. Mm -hmm. This time, I was told, the issue of surveillance took the form of clandestine, ultra-Orthodox informers. Mm -hmm. And again, that's something we can talk about more later, um, if you're interested. In 1943, Hannah Arendt published a short art article called We Refugees, where she wrote, if we should start telling the truth that we are nothing but Jews, it would mean that we exposed ourselves to the fate of human beings, who unprotected by any specific law or political convention are nothing but human beings. I can hardly imagine an attitude more dangerous since we actually live in a world in which human beings as such have ceased to exist for quite a while." End quote. Arendt wrote about the uselessness of attempts at assimilation. She spoke of a character who she called Mr. Cohen, who when he lived in Germany was so patriotic and tried so hard to fit in that he was 150% German. When forced to leave Germany, he moved to Prague and became 150% Czech and then 150% French, and so on and on, interminably attempting to demonstrate that he was forever, everywhere, and anywhere a loyal citizen, anything but a Jew. She later elaborated on the idea that human beings as such have ceased to exist when analyzing the contradictions inherent in the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. From the beginning, the paradox involved in the Declaration of the Inalienable Human Rights was that it reckoned with an abstract human being who seemed to exist nowhere. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar um, with this text. The whole question of human rights was therefore quickly and inextricably blended with the question of national emancipation. Only the emancipated sovereignty of the people, of one's own people, seemed able to achieve them." End quote. If today, nearly seven decades after Arendt first published these thoughts, human beings still require citizenship to attain a set of political rights, and if minority or subaltern status is still a precarious position, 
what happens when a minority position shifts to become the substance of sovereign citizenship in a modern state. Does the sovereignty of one's own people achieve inalienable human rights for them? Do the problems of assimilation end with sovereignty in the ethno-national state? Surely Jews are still subjected to processes of assimilation even in the Jewish state, or maybe especially in the Jewish state, where Jews must be kept Jewish so that there will be a sovereign people for the nation state. And just yesterday I was reading some underlining um, in Hannah Arendt's books about issues very similar to this, and again, we can talk afterwards. In other words, I think this problem cannot be separated from the struggles of minority or subaltern groups for human and civil rights. It is indeed the other side of the same problem. Patrick Wolfe, who is an anthropologist who works in Australia, has suggested that assimilation might be considered comparable to or having effects similar to genocide. He was thinking about the case of indigenous people in settler colonial societies and the trade-offs indigenous people make, exchanging political rights for their way of life, which immediately calls into question the meaning of rights in the first place. We might formulate it this way. If, as in the case of Australia, you stop being Aboriginal, which of course you cannot because these determinations are racialized and really have very little to do with individual choice. Or if you stop behaving so much like an Aborigine, you can be a member of Australian society. But this formulation is filled with impossibilities. So also with Aaron's case of what was called emancipation for the Jews of Western Europe. For Jews to become full members of society required their assimilation, becoming unlike other Jews. And again, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Um, quote, Jews who heard the strange compliment that they were exceptions, exceptional Jews, knew quite well that it was this ambiguity, that they were Jews but not like Jews, which opened the doors of society to them. End quote. Emancipation did not make Jews citizens like all others. This is the story of secularism, a shift that might be thought of as either the beginning of the expulsion of the Jews from Europe or its continuation, an expulsion that appears in <coughs> retrospect to have undermined the very notion of Europe. But these shift, shifts also produced the ethno-national state of Israel as the solution to the problem of ethno-nationalism in Europe. In other words, enlightenment and emancipation set the stage both for genocidal destruction and for claims for liberation through self-determination in the nation state. The dire result of the, that shift for the Arab population of Palestine, along with the critique of modern political Zionism, have been the focus of much critical scholarship and understandably so. But what this shift has meant for contemporary Israeli Jews has yet to be, to be theorized in similar depth. We know that assimilation does not end for Jews when they come to Israel. In fact, it doesn't necessarily end for those who have been there for generations. One could argue, of course, that the Jews were indigenous to Europe. After all, how long does a people have to live in a place in order to be native? And yet, they were created as outsiders, strangers, distanced and segregated, marked and expelled, converted and then made to confess that they remained unconverted, and eventually, with the advent of enlightenment, told that they needed to transform themselves again in a new way, assimilating without converting, without becoming something else, without changing categorical membership, <coughs> but by adjusting their Jewishness through a new and additional sense of being, that of citizen, which would allegedly place them on equal moral and political footing with their Christian, that is European, compatriots. So what can be said of the requirement, again, to assimilate when they are sovereign citizens in their own nation state? 
Some of the examples that I've shared with you today may seem trivial, even amusing. And there are, of course, other examples. Some quite sensational and others very disturbing. I could go on and provide additional examples of the struggle to be Jewish in the Jewish state. But the question is this. When we talk about the modern state of Israel, can we say that its existence has ended the seemingly impossible assimilation for the Jews, has ended the problem of seemingly impossible assimilation for the Jews? In Israel and elsewhere, we often focus on the question of rights and liberties for minority groups because the liberal narrative can always read these cases as part of the unfinished project of liberation. But if the demos in democracy is necessarily exclusionary, that exclusion also has implications for the everyday lives of those who are not excluded, perhaps sometimes even forcibly included. Is such an inclusion an answer to the problems of assimilation for Jews in Europe that Hannah Arendt wrote about? As Amnon Raz so clearly states it, the Jews had to be emancipated from themselves in order to become citizens in Enlightenment Europe. If what we see now in the modern state of Israel is a struggle to be Jewish and a struggle for control over what will count as being Jewish, can this be understood as a struggle against such emancipation? Is it still a struggle against assimilation? And if Patrick Wolf is right, and assimilation is tantamount to the destruction of a people, is this also a struggle against such destruction? The modern state of Israel, established to ensure the survival of Jews as Jews, is now also a place where Jews must assimilate in order to be themselves, rather than abstract individuals and to have their political rights guaranteed. Jews often worry about assimilation in places outside of Israel. They express concern that members of the community will adopt practices of the broader non-Jewish society, giving up Jewish practices and becoming non-Jews. But perhaps exile does not end with the return of Jews to the modern state of Israel. Here, I am suggesting that because the Jewish state requires Jewish citizens, it must produce them as such, which requires particular forms of cultural training, what anthropologist Iwa Ang calls cultural subjectification. For the case of Israeli Jews, the content of Israeliness might shift over time, and indeed it has but the requirement to be Jewish remains, and the struggle over what that entails continues. Israeli Jews must be Jewish in specific ways that conform to state requirements, which may also shift over time, but continue to require particular ways of being, physically embodying and engaging in particular actions while refraining from others, particular ways of being that will be counted as Jewish. In some cases, as we've seen, the desire to make a living can conflict with state requirements to be Jewish, whether one agrees with these requirements or not. Ironically, sometimes these requirements, like mandatory conscription, can be seen as conflicting with what some Jews see as their duty to serve God. In other words, the requirement of citizenship for Jews in the Jewish state can prevent people from being Jewish. Assimilation, to cause a person or group to become part of a particular society or culture, does not end with sovereignty, but continues and is transformed. The struggle now surrounds the question of who a Jew can be and who a Jew must be in the Jewish state. Peter <coughs> Geertz taught us that to be human is not to be every man. It is to be a particular kind of man. And of course, men and women differ. But as Hannah Arendt explains, this notion is hardened and sharpened when it transforms <coughs> this empirical and theoretical observation into an instrument of rule. The problem of human beings as such having ceased to exist is not resolved. 
when a minority group or a subaltern group becomes sovereign citizens in this case. Struggles of minority and subaltern groups for human and civil rights should not be seen as separate from those of sovereign citizenship. Indeed, this is the other side of the same problem. Popular sovereignty might not be liberating in the ways we think. Instead, it imposes new kinds of restrictions, some of them wildly, wildly absurd, Shaking, shaping and molding people, disciplining their bodies and actions so that they can be a particular people, the people required for sovereignty in the nation state. Political liberation emerges from a subject position that is constituted through these disciplinary, disciplining processes, everyday constraints on such matters as how one can make a living, who one can marry, and ultimately who one can be. If one is squeezed into a particular form, in this case kept Jewish through a set of rules and restrictions in order to be constituted as sovereign citizens, having achieved political liberation, then what is such political liberation after all? Um, I would start maybe with one question before uh, uh, we open it up. But before I get to the question, I had a, uh, I, I, I was wondering if I, if I missed something. This couple uh, that came to Israel and were to live there during their retirement, uh, did they get an official and actual explanation why it was denied? Or is, was that they were uh, members of the Jews for Jesus, is, is your assumption? They, what did they, the official letter say? So they got a letter saying that they were um, denied citizenship. Um, and it was not put in writing that it was because they were Jews for Jesus. Mm -hmm. But they hired a lawyer who inquired on their behalf. And this was the explanation that he received. So right. it is nowhere in writing. Mm -hmm. So in, in a conversation, someone told the lawyer, well, that's what it is. Yeah, someone from the... From the Ministry of the Interior. Interior. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, one question I had was, <clears throat> you discussed several forms of, of, of being Jewish and how this could be defined, the question, uh, you know, uh, genealogy or, or um, the rights of return, and then there would also be uh, um, modes of ascription or self-identification as possibilities, right? And, and you had several cases of, of self-identifying Jews that then ran into trouble with, the, with some official uh, understanding of it. Um, in, in the context of, of Hannah Arendt, I was, uh, uh, I was wondering if uh, about another way of uh, activating the self-identification as, uh, as Jewish you had individual cases running into trouble with, with uh, state authorities or with, with legal uh, uh, restraints or interpretations of, 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 of legal rules. But what about an acting in concert as Jews, as a self-identifying self Jew who, let's say, acts together with other uh, people running in, into, in, into similar problems that self, the self-identification is not the accepted or a accepted form of sovereignty, as, as, as you put it. I, I get to that also because in my reading of Arendt, being sovereign is mostly uh, understood as, as being free, meaning as uh, uh, acting out the possibility to act, so to speak. And uh, so, so that's the background against which my question of uh, if there is another way of, uh, of um, let's say, uh, de defining citizenship as a form of, of, of action and in combination with self-identification. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're getting at. I'm, I'm getting, I, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to uh, shift the focus or or not shift, but to, to expand the focus from, from legal conflict to political conflict. Okay. And so, in and terms of, of being able to gain citizenship, or in terms of being able to participate in the political process? In, in terms of problematizing 
the the fact is that that's how I heard your talk that for example self identification is not an accepted way of defining Jewishness in Israel. Okay. okay. And so I'm, I'm asking if there could be forms of making the quest or request for self identification a case. Ah, ah, I see. And that's let's say. Ah, and then and acting. then that would be the act of of, of being political. A, and of being a, Jewish in a in in a, in a political role yeah. by self-identifying and, and claiming self-identification as the definition. Right. Um, potentially, such a thing could be imagined. Mm. Um, but right now, the way things work in um, in Israel, which by the way, considers itself a secular state, mm. which is another sort of wow. very interesting <laughs> twist to the whole story. It is not. Um, it is a it theocracy. Con it considers itself a secular state and, and claims that it was established as a secular state mm -hmm. by the secular Zionist movement, which made an agreement with the ultra-Orthodox community in order to get them to sign on mm -hmm. to the idea of the modern state because the ultra-Orthodox and the Orthodox um, were in fact opposed. Um, mm -hmm. And so the way things are now, the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox have control over determining who is a Jew, mm -hmm. and therefore who can be a citizen based on Jewish The point citizen. when they moved to Israel was to take over control <coughs> and to change this state of Israel from secular to a more religious. Who who did this? The uh, ultra orthodox that left from this country to go to Israel, then it took over the settlers that took over in the West Bank. Okay, so there are all different sorts of orthodox Jews. Um, mm -hmm. There are the kind who who you're referring to as settlers who are sometimes called ultra nationalist orthodox Jews. Um, but so the ultra nationalist and the ultra orthodox. Are, are two different groups because the ultra orthodox sometimes you call them Haredim, all dressed in black, mm -hmm. big beards, and all of that. Very many of them are in fact opposed to the state of Israel. They live there, mm -hmm. but they are opposed to its existence as a state <coughs> because human beings should not have intervened. The state would be established in God's good time when the Messiah would come. Um, and so, and so, technically, they they are opposed, um, and and then there are other kinds of Jews who believe that they have not only a right but a responsibility to God to live on all the land of Israel, mm -hmm. and those are sort of religiously motivated settlers who have moved to the West Bank and so forth. I don't know if their goal is specifically to make Israel more religious. That's a, I think, a slightly or different observance. question. observance. I don't know what word you want, you want to use. They no. want to, and, and this is the, what I've gotten from what I've read um, and talked to people about, was that they wanted the laws to be more enforced in terms of the Torah, whereas the majority of Israelis, the majority of people that are citizens that are living in Israel and that are Jews, the, the ones that are Jews, not the majority, but the ones that are Jews, don't want this. They like their secular life, and they are not, nobody's really anxious to go back to, go into a more religious, observant kind of lifestyle. So, so in fact, most Israeli Jews are, are quite secular, mm -hmm. and quite happy to be secular, mm -hmm. and very many of them, in fact, hate um, Orthodox Jews. The, very, yeah. mm -hmm. the left wing secular also hate religiously motivated settlers. Um, and so they hate them for different reasons. They hate Orthodox Jews because they claim that Orthodox Jews only take from the state and don't give back because they don't want to serve in the mm -hmm. army and, mm -hmm. and so forth and they, mm -hmm. they take money from welfare. That. They hate religiously motivated settlers because they feel that those people are responsible for continuing the conflict with the Palestinians. But I take issue with this idea that the religiously motivated settlers want Israel to become more 
religious or follow more religious <clears throat> laws. It is true that more young people in Israel are becoming newly religious. Um, that's just a trend that happens to be going on, and and certainly um, nationalist religious people are in favor of it. But in general, they believe in a theology that says that the secular have a very important role to play in the unfolding of events um, as, as they should unfold, right? So they <coughs> are followers of the Rabbi Cook, who, um, who was known for suggesting that secular Jews, although they might be mistaken in their ways, had an important role to play in the return to the land um, and that they would provide sustenance for the core of um, observant Jews that would then emerge afterwards. And so they're not really anti-secular in that sense. <laughs> because Sam. they turn on the lights but they are the Yeah, so my, my question is actually similar to yours. Um, but <coughs> so there's a there's a there's a distinction and aren't aren't my you know, my primary background on this. Okay. Um, I'm not a religious <laughs> scholar. But Arendt draws a distinction between nation-state sovereignty and political sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And then you you inserted a, a kind of religious sovereignty into the conversation um, because we the, the nation-state of Israel um, ha is secular, and yet there is... Um, you know, clearly a large role that the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox play in regulating the institutions that give form to daily life and how the state is organized. And so I'm wondering, I'm wondering if, I mean, the logical outcome of your argument is, is somewhat similar to our ends in that it has to, and that we should get rid of the state of Israel, right? as a nation state, which she, which she, I mean, she breaks with Zionism, and she argues for a kind of federated, mm -hmm. self-identifying mm -hmm. form of Judaism. So, so my, you could just my talk reading, about that. Yeah, yeah, my reading of Arendt is that her opposition <coughs> is to ethno-nationalism, <coughs> right? And so her idea was that political liberation had a better chance um, in a different kind of organization because ethno-nationalism is necessarily exclusionary mm -hmm. and that that was the source of the problem. Mm -hmm. And so here I'm saying, yes, ethno-nationalism is necessarily exclusionary, right? It leaves out people who are not Jewish. It, it leaves out Palestinians. And, and of course, we've read tons of information about that. But what I'm saying is, at the same time, it also forces Jews to be Jews in particular ways that might not be so liberating, right? right? And so um, what I think is interesting is, of course, Arendt was writing these things decades ago. And I think, for the most part, scholars of nations and nationalism do not disagree with her. And yet we continue to suggest sovereignty in the ethno-national state as a form of liberation for for groups that do not yet have it. Mm -hmm. Certainly for the Palestinians, this is what we recommend. Mm -hmm. Why would we do that mm -hmm. if we see all those flaws? Mm -hmm. So Arendt had this idea that a place like the United States, for example, mm -hmm. might be better mm -hmm. than an ethno-national configurated um, state. Whether or not we've gotten away from all of those problems um, is, is for you to answer, but, um, but indeed, this was the argument that she was making, yes. And so I am taking her argument and suggesting that it has impl implications not only for the minority and subaltern groups. It has implications for everyone. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Because if you're going to be a Jewish state, you have to have Jews. And, and, and that means somebody has to decide who's going to count as a Jew and what that's going to mean. Mm -hmm. And so, um, why should that be left to the minister of the interior? Mm -hmm. Why, why, why? Why should that be left to the interior ministry? Who should decide? Mm -hmm. Who do you the think should the decide? The interior ministry always has a, almost a dirty name everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff had a question. 
Um, I appreciated your talk very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you had a you asked a question that ran something like, "What are the possibilities and limits of religious freedom for hegemonic groups as opposed to minority groups?" Yes. Um, and I think that's a very good question to ask. On the basis of your talk, um, I'm wondering whether we might want to draw distinctions between different kinds of hegemonic groups. Okay. Because it seems like there might be confidently hegemonic groups and anxiously hegemonic groups. <laughs> who, hegemonic okay. groups who feel that, or who imagine that at some point in the near future or the further future, they their hegemony will be precarious. Uh -huh. um, and I guess I'm wondering, would is that a helpful? Dis I mean, is that a, a helpful distinction to make? Because it sounds to me like Jews, at least many Jews in the state yeah. of Israel, would might be characterized as kind of anxiously Anxious. hegemonic, Anxious. and I mean, that that that's perhaps the the yeah. uh, the impulse to to codify and to mm -hmm. um, regiment the criteria of Jewishness is tied to this sense of anxious hegemony. Yeah, um, I, I think that's lovely. And, and I think indeed there is this sense of anxiety. Um, there's a sense of existential anxiety that is perpetuated in Israel on a regular basis, whether or not there's any factual basis to support that anxiety. Um, but it is promulgated. Um, and so indeed there is that kind of anxiety. But then there's another thing that's going on um, among the hegemonic group, and that is that there are a range of, of ways of being Jewish, right? And there are a range of different kinds of, of groups, right? People um, identify as different kinds of Jews. So there are the national orthodox, the religiously motivated settlers, there are the ultra-orthodox, there are the secular, there are what are known as masorti, the traditional Jews. And when I was doing part of my research, and I went around and asked people what they thought about their ability to be Jewish in the way that they wanted to, those that identify as part of the national religious, national orthodox, the, the settler movement, seemed to think that my question was ridiculous. Wait, sorry, the question you were asking, what was that again? It's whether or not they felt they were going to be Jewish ah, okay. in Israel, okay, or, or if the state interfered with their ability to be Jewish. Okay. And they feel currently in such power, and so confident, mm -hmm. in fact, that they're not really worried. The question that you asked was relevant. They were like they were. They were like that question makes no sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, secular Jews, on the other hand, will give you a long list of complaints. They can't get married the way they want. They have to go to the Orthodox rabbinate. There's a big tourist industry in Cyprus of young Jews from Israel who go over there to get married and then come back already married. <laughs> because that is acceptable. So I mean, imagine, here you are, a, a, a sovereign citizen, a member of the majority in your own country, and you can't get married the way you want, right? You can't get married by a reform rabbi. You can't get married in a civil ceremony. It's, that does not count. Um, so, so yes, there's an existential anxiety in general. Um, but right now, the national orthodox are feeling quite powerful in the state of Israel and are mm -hmm. less worried. So I asked them if, for example, their belief that they ought to settle the land, right, and sometimes they get kicked out by the government mm -hmm. if they didn't feel the state was interfering with that ability. And, um, and they said yes, but they sort of smiled that it would be a matter of time mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and they would be able to do what they wanted. Um, on the other hand, there were some who pointed to the problem of rebuilding the temple. There is a group um, call, that sponsors what's called the Temple Institute um, in Jerusalem, and these are Jews who want to rebuild the temple that was destroyed and where currently there are two big mosques. Um, and, um, and so sometimes they go on hunger strikes and, and so forth um, in order to make the case for, for rebuilding the temple, and the state interferes with their ability to, 
to do this. You mean rebuilding the temple and taking down the mosques? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, the state what? interferes with that. <clears throat> There was, yes. a question, there was a question here on the... Oh, okay. it, yeah. It's not so much a question as, uh, regardless of what the, the state of Israel declares, they are a theocracy. Uh, they're as much a theocracy as um, medieval Europe was seven, eight hundred years ago. Um, and the question is, which sovereignty will dominate? Because if they are both at loggerheads, and there is kind of a... Uh, a mishmash of uh, of rules and regulations, um, they will continue to be existentially <laughs> aggravated, nervous, and uh, troubled. So, I, I'm not sure that it's fair to say that Israel is in fact a theocracy because their their written laws are not the commandments of the Torah, and but what they do have is sort of separate family law and marriage laws that the rabbinate is in control of, mm -hmm. right? But if you commit a, an ordinary crime, you know, you rob a store or something, mm -hmm. that's got nothing to do with the rabbinical authorities. Mm -hmm. If you want to get a divorce, on the other hand, that has everything to do with the rabbinical authorities, and you go to their courts. Mm -hmm. and, and these are some um, legal processes that have remained since the Ottoman Empire. So if you're not Jewish and you're Muslim, you go to Muslim court, okay, for example, and, and that, that also for family issues. Um, so, so in some ways, yes, religious laws are absolutely in play and it's very difficult to think of how precisely this is a secular state. On the other hand, on any random Saturday, if you go to the beach in Tel Aviv, you will see it is packed with girls in bikinis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's not exactly Iran. But right? that's in Tel Aviv. That's in Tel Aviv, which is in Israel. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we're no, the I, no, I do understand that's that, but that's, that's, Tel Aviv is the sin city. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go to Ashdod, go to Ashkelon, go to some of the other beach towns. Um, Haifa, you will, you will see the same sorts of things. And so, um, and so even though there is this strange thing going on, right? And, and I think it has to do with the need to have people be Jewish, right? Um, because you can't have a Jewish state without Jews. And so you run into the problem of, of how to make that definition. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, in the United States, when people want to become Americans, they also they have to prove that they know history. They have to prove that they know how our political system works. They don't have to prove that they go to church on Sundays. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so, and so, yes, right. <laughs> Did you say not yet? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The gentleman. Yes. And just that I, I think someone ran a full page ad in the Times a few weeks ago that I think it was in two year by the year 2020 only. The Jews will be only 49% of the population of Israel. Of greater Israel. Greater maybe. Israel, yeah. yeah. Well, so, so how do they deal with that? So, so this is part of the existential... I was um, wondering about that myself. Yes. Yeah. Right. So this is part of the, the existential anxiety. But um, bear in mind, when you're talking about those kind of numbers, you're talking about the occupied West Bank. Mm, yes, mm -hmm. yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and not inside Israel proper, in the internationally recognized borders of the state. Oh, okay. So those are two very different things. Inside the internationally recognized borders of the state, the Jews are a majority and probably will be for a very long time. If you include the West Bank, mm. or also Gaza, mm -hmm. then there ultimately will be fewer Jews. Mm in a short amount of time. This is one of the arguments that people make for why um, they don't want to annex that territory, right? Because if Israel annexes the occupied territories and ultimately the Jews become a minority in their own state, then it either stops being a Jewish state and becomes a Palestinian state, or they have to have two sets of laws. Mm -hmm. And, and this makes it difficult to call yourself a democracy, right, if you have a separate set of laws for your Arab citizens. Um, so, but indeed, this is part of the existential anxiety that is very deeply felt um, in Israel all the time. One, the demographic issue, but also Iran, 
you know, he's going to bomb them off the face of the universe. And there are all sorts of existential anxieties. Yeah. Being surrounded by enemies. Yes. Thank you so much for the talk. I Thank really you for coming. Oh, good. Okay. I have a question about, um, to get back to the Jews for Jesus for a minute. Yes. <laughs> um, the, I would just like, I, I know this may not be a particular focus of your research, so um, any thoughts you have on this, um, I welcome, but I understand that this question is a bit outside the purview. Um, the question of the ultra-Orthodox Jews, I mean, what, what's interesting to me is, here you have a group of people who effectively deny the state. Right or, or or deny deny the the legitimacy right of the political state, mm -hmm. and somehow this is less of a threat or somehow less of a of a pressure point on Jewishness or on Jewish identity believe Jesus. than believing in Jesus. And I just was what like what's the flavor? I mean, what there's just a lot going on here clearly. Um, <laughs> And I just wanted to hear some thoughts from you about what the sort of grayscale is of of this, or like, are there other categories that just automatically get you a no step from the Ministry of the Interior? I mean, I, now you've got me really thinking about this question. So, so, so that's actually a fascinating juxtaposition, right? So. Ultra-Orthodox who are opposed to the state are not considered threatening. Mm -hmm. um, even though um, there are scholars who write about the ultra-Orthodox as the threat from within. There's a book mm -hmm. by a man named Yaakov Rabkin who, who writes precisely about that. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, in Israel, they are not considered a threat because they're not politically active in the same sense. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they mm -hmm. support Palestinians and Palestinian mm -hmm. rights and and this sort of thing, but the overwhelming majority of them are concerned with studying Torah, going to yeshiva, and and that's what's important and that's what matters, right? So they're not going to overthrow the government, and in fact, they work with the government, and they are inside the government, right? So they oppose the state, yet they're perfectly happy to be in control of who is a Jew. So, so this is a strange balance. The idea of accepting Jesus as the Messiah is considered a threat to Jewishness. Mm -hmm. There is existential anxiety, fear, that these people will come to Israel and try to convert young mm -hmm. Jews. Mm -hmm. And this will be the end of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. so, so it's existential <laughs> anxiety about what is Jewish, right? And in fact, Jews for Jesus do stand on street corners mm -hmm. in major cities in Israel and pass out flyers mm -hmm. and try to convert people to their beliefs. Mm -hmm. Ultra-Orthodox Jews do not try to convert people mm -hmm. who are not Jewish. They do try to get Jews to return to the fold. They will stand on street corners and give Shabbat candles out to women and offer men to come wear the tefillin mm -hmm. and, and pray um, to, to carry out the mitzvahs that, that they ought to to do. Um, but the idea of accepting <coughs> Jesus and trying to convert Jews to accept Jesus is considered a threat to, to Judaism, right? And therefore to the future of the state. Because then you would have no Jews, right? Because from the point of view of Orthodox Judaism, there's no such thing as Jews for Jesus. You accept Jesus, you're Christian. Right. Mm -hmm. End of story, right? Right. right? This makes no sense uh -huh. from, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Now from the point of view of the Messianic from the point of view of the Messianic Jews, it makes perfect sense. And according to all the rules that actually exist where you have to prove your Jewish genealogy, they have it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that's a threatening idea, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there was another part of your question, if there are other things that are... Um, well, yeah, that's useful because it, it sort of distinguishes between, again, this question of nation versus subject or individual, right? Because to me, following the logical conclusion of ultra-Orthodox Jews being part of the government, I mean, that's not perceived as an existential threat to the state, but rather th because there isn't this sort of possibility of personal, no one's worried about personal, um, uh, uh, you know, 
people are, it's, it's comfortable enough that it's not thought of as a threat to have a, organ, a group of people who advocate for, for the uh, dismantling of the state well, to but be they part don't. of the state. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right. So, uh -huh. so first of all, there are very many ultra-Orthodox mm -hmm. Jews, and not all of them are opposed mm -hmm. to the state. Okay, mm -hmm. Not all of them. Mm -hmm. A subset of them mm -hmm. are. They do, not, um, they do not advocate for dismantling the state. They said it was a mistake. They said we should have waited. But they don't advocate for dismantling the state because they're just not politically active in this way. They mm -hmm. pray. Mm -hmm. They serve God because that is the way mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the Messiah will come. The Messiah will come when Jews behave like Jews. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a reinforcement of this idea of, of the religious aspect of the religion. OK, that's yeah. really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so earlier in the talk, you briefly mentioned the position of Mizrahi Jews yes. in the state of Israel, and I've been reading a lot about the like racial hierarchies uh -huh. in Israel, and I was wondering if that had anything to do or somehow played into this existential anxiety we've been talking about in terms of uh, Jews from the Middle East and North Africa somehow not fitting the designated mold of Jew Jewishness, I guess. Um, um, actually, Jews from the Middle East and North Africa do, we do. fit. Okay. The, the mold of, of what counts as being Jewish, and, and they are not seen as a threat in any way. Um, they do, in some ways, have second-class citizenship, right, right for, for all sorts of, of other reasons, because of where they were settled in the state, um, and all sorts of things. They are generally considered traditional Jews, um, and they very often, you know, keep the Sabbath, um, and, and take the holidays more seriously than some of the sort of Ashkenazi secular mm. Jews. Um, they are not considered a threat, um, which is interesting, yeah. right? Um, because they have been discriminated against over time. Um, but again, maybe this is similar to, to the answer I just gave to this question, and, and that is because um, the overwhelming majority of Mizrahi and Mizrahi Jews um, in Israel are not really politically active on their own behalf. Mm -hmm. They don't think of themselves as Arab Jews, even though the activist ones do. Mm -hmm. They're very busy saying, we are Israelis, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. and wanting to fit in okay. and be accepted and be Israeli just like every other Israeli. Um, and so that may have a, a lot to do with it. Yeah. We have time for maybe one more question. I saw. Yeah, I, I've been struggling to formulate or <laughs> make a question out of it. And I'm just a comment. sort of generally wondering where this leaves other definitions of what's considered, what could be considered Jewish, mm -hmm. right? Not as Judaism necessarily, but sort of cultural definitions, mm -hmm. definitions that have a deep meaning yet are not bound to a religious text, but I can't, yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, I haven't really thought about it in terms of what other definitions are possible or, or, or who should organize to come up with other definitions. My interest is what is the effect or outcome of the way things are, right? Mm. And, 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 the, and the thing is that Judaism as a religion is something that came about at a particular historical moment. Mm -hmm. And it came about as a religion that is like Protestantism, right? Something that you can do at home compared to the way you will behave in public. Something that you can do one day a week, you know, when you go to church. And this dramatically transformed what it meant to be Jewish dramatically transformed. It was once the case that Jewish law provided an ethical foundation for the community of Jews. And then that got separated out because you ought to be a citizen in Europe and subject to the laws of the state mm -hmm. and not have your own sort of separate set of laws that made you part of a community. The problem with the Jews was that when Judaism became a religion in that sense in Europe, it didn't stop people from thinking of Jews as Jews. And so they were racialized, which had really devastating outcomes for people. Right? 
Um, so I, I haven't really been concerned about what other ways we ought to think about categorizing who is or who is not yeah. a Jew. It's not for me to say. Um, my interest is in the outcomes of this particular definition of Judaism as a religion. And some people say, well, it's a Christian definition. And by that, set, by, by, by that sense, some people say, well, and therefore Israel is in fact a Christian state. I mean, if you take the, if you, if you continue that logic. Yeah. Right. yeah, no, I was just wondering because you could, what, what you stressed was that Israel needs Jews to be a Jewish state. France and, and needs French Fran people. Yeah, so I, would, I was going to continue that sort of sentence and then could you make the same argument with some modifications about So, I mean, could you say that maybe Israel needs Israelis? Yeah. Right? Instead of Israel needs Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then being an Israeli is, would be a matter of citizenship, of living according to whatever the laws of the state are, mm -hmm. knowing the history of the state and how the politics works and so forth. And then you could say Israel needs Israelis like France yeah. needs or French people. Or needs Jews but not people who practice Judaism necessarily. I mean... Well, I mean, so, but now we're back to, to Aaron's idea about whether it's the ethno-national state mm -hmm. that's a good thing for liberation, mm -hmm. or a democratic state of all its citizens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. In which case, Palestinians can be Israelis, right? Yeah. They are. Well, but I, I mean... Yes, no, but I mean, <laughs> it, it wouldn't be, the Jewish state wouldn't, need so much to be, have Jews in order to exist, it could have Israelis in order to exist, citizens of the state. Well, they right. are, yeah, and then, rather and then, than define and, it by religion. And then those citizens can be Jews and Christians and Palestinians and whoever, mm -hmm. right? But now we're back to our existential anxiety, <laughs> right? right? This, this idea has been seen as tantamount to the destruction of the Jewish state and therefore the destruction of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Because who will protect them? Don't yeah. other Thank you. Middle Eastern um, nations suffer that same situation? Uh, um, of needing to have Muslims? Well, they're, they're, yeah, but there are Muslims and then there are Muslims. There's Sunnis, there's, there's uh, Kurds, there are Shiites, there are other splinter groups. Just like yeah. Syria needs Syrians to be a state country, you know, right? all the Syrians are all over And the world. there are some arguments that it should be three countries. What? Kurds, Sunnis, and uh, yeah, Shiites. We're getting a little... Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Maybe we can continue, or someone can continue the conversation uh, informally, because uh, several of us have to go to teach. 